What's good, dude? Hey, Rob. How are you? Great, great. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for taking your time to uh, be on the podcast. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Let me um, <clears throat> let me just make sure my microphone is okay. Uh, all right. I have this little tiny like little snowball mic. Does that sound any better? Yeah, it works perfect. Okay, cool. Good yeah. stuff. <laughs> so for our listeners, I uh, want to introduce Rob Mitz uh, here. Right, that's so it's it's pronounced Mitzdeifer, but the, it, it's, a, it's a weird last name, I know. So, so it's all good. <laughs> so uh, Rob uh, grew up uh, in New Jersey, right? And uh, you were doing some sailing in the early age and uh, you decided to become a meteorologist. Uh, that's why you went to Penn, uh, Penn State University uh, to get the Bachelor of Science in Meteorology. Is that correct? Totally. I just got so frothy on weather and waves that I figured I might as well study it and make a profession out of it. And that's what I did. <laughs> Were you doing any yeah. forecasting prior to, uh, you know, getting into college and, and getting degree uh were you doing forecasting for your friends and uh, other things like that yeah i definitely did some casual forecasting because you know being a surfer you're always always wondering how how's it going to be at my local spot so yeah that's pretty much what got me into it through my through my like teen years because i started teaching surf lessons and would have to plan the lessons around the conditions and you know in the summer in new jersey it's really small normally so you don't have to go too crazy into the forecast but yeah it's it's just been a passion of mine for my whole life basically and since then getting a degree and you know after that i worked in an airport for a little bit doing forecasting but yeah working for surfline has been great it's been almost five years now at with surfline mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right and then so what changed in terms of forecasting for the past i would say five years i uh, you know, I started surfing back in 2013 and I didn't even know about forecasts or forecasts when I started. So I was driving to the beach every single day just to find waves. <laughs> and, then, and then now I realized I was getting skunked all the time, pretty much. I was just every day I would just drive and then it would be like stormy. I'm like, what's going on? I mean, <laughs> uh, anything changed in, in terms of predictions? Is it doing better now? Uh, you think yeah, that's a great question. So it is it is funny. Everyone who starts, you know, as a novice surfer maybe doesn't understand the whole aspect of you really have to time your surfs and you have to get really good at being able to do that mm -hmm. uh, if you actually want to get good conditions on a consistent basis. So yeah, it's funny. Like for, from my perspective, since I've been a professional meteorologist for about like eight or nine years, it's just been you know, incremental increases in accuracy, um, especially, you know, when you're talking between, you know, over the next week or so, once you get really past eight or nine days, forecasts aren't very good. And that's, it's been like that for several years, but, you know, over the years, basically as computing power has improved, um, the ability for the computer models to predict more accurately, whether, you know, you're talking about a t forecast for tomorrow, or a forecast for you know later this week, um, or even sometimes you can even go out you know like I said like eight or nine days and get a little bit of a decent forecast there. But yeah, I've I've noticed that things have been improving, and with my own personal forecast ability, you know, really it just takes experience um, to to see those incremental changes. And and we do we have been starting to track that at Surfline uh just to see like our own forecasting biases uh how we can improve there and stuff like that so yeah i mean there's a ton of a ton of cool things happening in the in the, the computing world mm -hmm. um that are you know changing the forecasting science and, and as we move into the next five to ten years it's going to be really cool to see that too yeah i think i've noticed uh for the past few years maybe three four years i started to you know kind of did my do my homework more uh, in terms of predicting, uh, you know, conditions, you know, based on the tools that you have at Surfline or any other uh, surf forecasting apps. Uh, and I feel like the swell period and that kind of data gets more 
uh, accurate now. Uh, however, the wind predictions are still off. I think maybe it depends on the weather patterns and you know the time of the season. It feels like in the spring, it's really unpredicted uh, versus you know the summer. Summer is kind of more accurate uh, and close to the fall, and then winter is a little bit unpredicted than spring. Do you think this is how uh, it, it is at this point at this moment? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's a good observation. I, I generally would agree with that because there's, you know, we live, you know, I'm, I'm in North Carolina, you're in New York, that's not really that far away. We live basically in one of the most active weather regions in the whole world. You know, if you look at, at some of the statistics with weather, you know, I mean, just living here, you understand it. Because um, one day it could be 60, the next day it's back to 20. Mm -hmm. In the spring, same thing can happen. Um, and then once you, when you involve that, and then you're talking about forecasting, because, you know, we're surfers, we want to know the forecast specifically for wind right along the coast. We don't care what's happening inland at mm -hmm. all, really. And <laughs> that, coastal, that coastal ecosystem is just so complicated because you have your waves of water, obviously the ocean, but then sometimes you have like back bays or sounds or inlets that can really act to mess with how the computer model will see the forecast um, because of those really small scale things that, mm -hmm. you know, end up making a big difference in the wind and, and the spring, especially when you have that cold ocean water or cold bay water coming off the winter, but then you can have warmer air moving in. And once you get those contrasting temperatures, the wind forecasts can completely break down. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great point. In the summer that happens less. And generally in the summer, the weather patterns a little bit more benign or, or a little bit more mellow so you rarely have those other than thunderstorms of course but you rarely have those days where you're like oh it's going to be you know blowing hard onshore but then maybe fog moves in and you know whenever there's fog it's rarely going to be that windy so th things happen you know certain times a year more than others and you, you definitely pick up on that yeah i feel like in the summer it's more predictable in terms of you know, getting cleaning condition in the morning when, you know, the, everything is kind of cooled off. And then as the day starts uh, after 9 a.m., then onshore winds usually pick up. So that's how I see, uh, you know, from my experience, usually <laughs> in the summer. Yeah, that's, that's a textbook summer pattern. Once the sun heats the ground, mm -hmm. get that onshore wind filling in. Um, that's just your typical sea breeze that happens in a lot of places once in, in, the, in the warmer months, for sure. Especially California. I think California is like, I would say 100% it happens like the same every day, usually early morning and clean. And then that's it. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's a textbook case where you get really cold, relatively cold ocean, you know, staying in the 50s all year. But then, you know, just inland on a sunny day, it could be 90. And when you have that temperature difference, you're pretty much always going to get a, a breeze off the ocean. That's that's just the way it works. So yeah. <laughs> and in terms of forecasting, the challenges. Uh, do you do forecasting for the West Coast or mostly just East Coast? Uh, so I think so. I think if you do East West Coast, I think it's more predictable than the East Coast because they have, you know, this all longer uh, period swells, and you, I would say, ninety percent, you're gonna get some swell versus east coast where we get the swells from some low pressures coming off the coast or some you know wind swells that blow up onshore for a little bit of time uh do you, th do you agree on that <laughs> west coast totally area. yeah so when i first started at surfline i was kind of thrown around a bunch of regions so i did you know a lot of central america mexico europe hawaii um so after seeing that, like, you're totally right, especially the West Coast, like, not only do they have a generally a typical wind pattern, like you just were talking about earlier, but the swells they get travel, you know, from big open ocean storms, and could it maybe takes five to 10 days for that swell to arrive. So you're, you're forecasting a swell from a storm that is either, you know, already happened, or happening now. Um, so it's kind of easier to dial things in um, based on that because, you know, we have certain observations where we can look at these storms. Um, like today, like if you're, I know that they're running uh, the sunset contest right now. Mm -hmm. And that storm, you know, developed like four days ago, three, four days ago. And the, uh, the guys who have been forecasting for it, you know, have been watching this storm every day. 
And that's that really helps them be able to dial it in as far as what sizes are going to be, how the conditions are going to be. But then when you flip the script over here to the East Coast, a lot of times we get storms that move from like, you know, they develop off the Rocky Mountains or move out of the Great Lakes. So you're not actually seeing that storm move over ocean. It, it You know, a lot of times when we're forecasting, you know, like later this week, we're going to see a swell, which will be pretty good swell. But sometimes the swell itself doesn't even develop until overnight. So we're kind of forecasting blind in a way where we don't have any concrete observations of, to see how the swell is developing, how it's doing until it's already there. Like some of the quicker hitting wind swell events we get, those can be tough because, you know, you go into the day before you're like, man, I don't see any observations. It's I'm just going to have to rely on the models completely, which isn't the best feeling, but yeah, on the West coast, they have normally a better and bigger lead time to, to be able to dial in the forecast. Mm -hmm. Because they already have solid data from the buoys, like thousand miles away from, uh, exactly. Surf. Yeah. Uh, so on the East coast, you, uh, see on a surf line, for instance, four or five days ahead. Uh, and that's, that's just computer model. So, uh, nothing is settled until probably 24 hours, uh, before the event. That's how we use. So it, so it depends on what you're looking at just to clarify, because if you, so the, a lot of what you might be familiar with is what are, are what we call our colored box regional forecasts, which, you know, has, whether it's blue for poor or green for fair, or orange for good. That stuff we actually, like myself and the rest of the team, actually input the numbers and the little blurbs about what the surf's going to be like. So that that is not actually computer based. That's based on us humans. But then a lot of the from the data side, you see like the wind direction or the the swell graphs or any of the maps and charts. That's fully computer based. So yeah, you're you're correct there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my friends ask me. Uh, I told them that I'm going to do for uh episode with you. Uh, they, they ask you, is it true that surf line, uh, you know, blows out those numbers for clicks and stuff? Is it, or it just surf line doesn't get involved into this and it just only computer models that generates that. So uh, this is, th there's two, there's two things I'll say about that. One is, you know, if you look at any website, say magic seaweed, you know, that is completely 100% uh, computer model based. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that one of the computer models that runs a lot of the swell data you'll see on the internet um, is the GFS model. It's called the Global Forecast System or the American Weather Model, basically. And that does have a high bias or a strong bias. When you look out a week plus, it tends to kind of ramp up these storms um, a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to keep in mind that just looking strictly based off data, you know, the, the weather models are, can be a little bit hot in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, and then based on that, like, I've gotten that question before, no doubt. So one of some of our computer science guys actually looked at the, you know, conglomerate of all of our all the whole forecast team over years and years over, you know, because we're basically producing forecasts human wise, mm -hmm. from day one to day eight. So you know, about a week out in time. And we've found that Generally speaking, the humans, as, as in us, we're actually a little bit conservative. So I, I can send you the link to this later, but mm -hmm. the data actually suggested that us humans are actually undercalling the surf in day four to seven or eight because we're always trying to be a little bit conservative. Like in, a, in an ideal situation, even if I see, okay, maybe there's going to be a big swell next weekend, well, I'd rather trend up into the forecast than all of a sudden go all in and call it, say, five to eight foot. And then maybe have to start backing down and maybe back it down to four to six. And then maybe it ends up only being four to five. I would rather start a little bit lower just because, you know, there's always uncertainty in, in the, in the forecast. So I'd rather trend up than have to trend down and kind of back off my forecast. And the numbers, believe it or not, say that, you know, every day out in the forecast period, our forecast team is actually becoming progressively more conservative on our numbers, which is something that I thought was interesting. Honestly, in the past year, I think you, you uh, Surfline uh, became more conservative in terms of numbers. You know, like it's actually good because it's really surprising. Sometimes you would call one to two 
and then you and it would be one foot uh one 12 second period as well i believe once i saw once and and it would be three to four foot sets i'm like this is great <laughs> and uh, <laughs> our people they they look at it as like one to two oh, it's small i'm not gonna get out but if you look at the model mm -hmm. and see the buoy readings then you probably can feel all right that might be something in there <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's from from my perspective, it's, you know, we never want to be that wrong. Like if we're calling it one to two and ends up three to four, that's not a good forecast. But I would rather it happen like that, where the surf actually comes in a little bit bigger than we expect, than it comes comes in smaller than we expect. Because, you know, a lot of this comes down to surfers expectations. And if we're calling it head high and good, and it only ends up being maybe waist to chest high, and maybe it's fun, but it's not good. That's mm -hmm. not good. Um, cause then that's when we get the emails and, and the, and the hate, <laughs> but you know, oh, you do get the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We get emails in every once in a while okay. it's, and it's okay. Like if us individually, if we make a mistake, like we're willing to write back and basically say exactly what happened, why the forecast failed and what we're going to do about it going forward. Mm -hmm. Because as, as a meteorologist, like that's all we can do, yeah. you know, things are going to not work out 100% of the time. That's just how the science is. Um, and you just got to learn from it. And every swell is different, but there's a lot of similar patterns that can set up with, with certain swells and just identifying those and being confident in your forecast is, is our goal at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be your tips to someone, you know, who doesn't live uh, right by the beach? I mean, I live like, two blocks away from the beach. I, you know, I, I don't think I would consider myself getting skunked if I, you know, wake up in the morning and it's, it's flat. But for some people who is traveling, when I used to live in the city, you know, one hour away, you got to wake up like really early for dawn patrol, drive out or take a train. Uh, what would be your tips to, uh, you know, what, what should they check before getting on the train or on the car and dry out like in tall, dark uh, pitch? Uh, what data on the Surfline for, uh, website, they should look at it first before making the move? I mean, besides the, your predictions already, like for, for instance, four to six. Yeah. yeah, so it's that's a great question. And really, it all comes down to experience because as you probably found when you were learning how to, you know, understand the forecast and understand um, observations and stuff like that, it takes some time. But, you know, specifically for New Yorkers or someone surfing in Western Long Island, there's a really good buoy network just offshore, you have basically the Barnegat buoy, uh, which is right off New Jersey. You have the New York Harbor buoy, which is really close to Rockaway and Queens and, uh, and Nassau County as well. And you got the Long Island buoy, which is kind of just south of the center of Long Island and then another one out by Montauk. So I would say like, you know, before I worked for Surfline, I did this all the time because I didn't live right next to the coast for, um, for a few years and would have to really figure things out. You know, if I did want to do a Dawn Patrol, mm -hmm. us waking up and doing the surf report, you know, we do it within a half an hour of sunrise, but a lot of times that's not early enough for some people. Mm -hmm. um, so what I would say is really get dialed in with understanding observations because you can look at the forecast the day before and, and you know, formulate a plan and everything. But the, the buoy observations, number one, wind observations, number two, um, and Surfline here, we're starting to install a bunch of um, wind and weather stations along, you know, in, at different surf spots. We don't have a great op observational network yet. Mm -hmm. So one um, website I would recommend is called Wind Alert. Uh, they have a ton of wind stations. You can pull it up in the map interface. So if you were to, you know, wake up really early, say like 4 or 5 a.m. to get to the beach for sunrise, check the buoys, check the wind observation. Um, and that's pretty much with enough experience, you can pretty much dial in exactly what the spot is going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to take, you know, months or years at, depending on how much, how much you surf and how much you really get into it. But, you know, keeping, keeping a log of your sessions and comparing that to what the buoy observations were. So the one thing I'll say, like, let's say you pull up the New York Harbor buoy. Oh, maybe um, I uh, share my screen with the, with the surf line. Is that okay? So we can yeah check on this upcoming forecast. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Uh, we'll try to dial it <laughs> together. 
Uh, yeah, so today is not the best. So if you scroll down a little bit, so the buoy observations are gonna be at the bottom of the page here. Um, yeah, keep going even more. Uh -huh. So here we go, nearby buoys, boom. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the, one of the most valuable things on this page. Mm -hmm. um, so New York Harbor entrance, that's the buoy I was talking about, just, you know, just a few miles off the coast. Um, you want to pin down to where it says individual swells there, right under that 1.3 feet of wave height in the top, top left. And that is mm -hmm. going to, yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. So right now, clearly it's flat because the biggest swell is actually a little northwest wind chop at three seconds. Like that's going the wrong way, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah. So that's not producing any surf. And then you only have some traces, you know, 0.7 feet. 0.4 feet east, southeast, and southeast swell. Like that, mm -hmm. if you ro rolled up to the beach, that would just be little, you know, little dribbles lapping up in the shore break. Mm -hmm. um, so, like this, this page, we actually just redesigned this um, recently, and mm -hmm. we're going to be making some improvements in the in the future on this for sure. Um, but you pull this up, say it's four or five a.m. in the morning. You look at what the individual swells are saying, and yeah, like where you're scrolling over too. That'll show the past couple of days um, worth of data. And that's important too, because if you wanted to say you surfed yesterday mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, is it going to be bigger today, bigger to, or smaller, or, you know, how's it going to be in comparison? So we break it down um, by individual swells, which is, it's important to note here, if you were to bring up um, this buoy, because this buoy is run by, I believe, what's called the National Data Buoy Center. Mm -hmm. And how they display their swell data isn't ideal. It's actually just displayed um, by what's called significant wave height and dominant period. Mm -hmm. So when you have those two, um, and let's say you have multiple swells running, like you have a really short period south wind swell or something, and then there's some underlying long period swell from like a tropical system or something, or a nor'easter, um, you won't always get the most accurate reading just looking off significant wave height and dominant period because if you have a really small 15 or 14 second swell running underneath some really short period but maybe like five or six foot at six seconds mm -hmm. the output is going to say like six feet at 15 seconds which is not what's actually happening um so yeah that's that's important to note so the in individual swells that i i pointed out before is is a good um reference and this this chart you're looking at is basically a breakdown of what the forecast of those individual swells should be and this um, is computer model like, it's a straight up computer model that shows us yeah. what's what do we expect exactly so you can see thursday some short period uh south wind swell building in you know mm -hmm. four to five foot of of swell at six seconds which would be about chest high or a little bit bigger I'm actually at the beach just because that's pretty short period. Um, but then, yeah, you see Friday and the colors start to change a little bit towards those mid periods, which is what we like. Um, yeah, like 10 feet at eight seconds or nine seconds dropping a little bit in the afternoon. It looks, Friday looks pretty good. Um, wind should turn offshore for you guys, Northwest. So if I were you, I would, I would try to surf Friday afternoon. <laughs> I'll try to schedule it, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, the good thing is that it's starting to get, I think last light is at like 6 p.m. now or a little bit after that. So if, if you work till five, you, have, you at least have a little bit of a window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's happening with these numbers on, you know, the numbers of the uh, swell height is increasing as well as the period, right? Uh, so it goes yep. up to, from six up to 10. Uh, uh, why? Is it going up? You know, why it's not like 16, I mean, not six seconds. And if they have a full swell of six seconds and should be on Friday, six seconds too, well, why does it change to nine seconds, 10 seconds? And uh, what, what's, what's, what's affecting it? It's a great question. So that's just a function of the evolution of a developing swell. So if you can imagine you have, let's, let's just go through the whole cycle here. Let's say you have a a really flat glassy ocean with basically no wind mm -hmm. it's flat there's no surface bump or anything and then you have a cold front let's let's take like this example you have a cold front moving in you start to get some wind well you're originally going to start with very small little ripples on the ocean as that wind 
increases and increases for a longer time and increases in strength, you're going to get a little bit bigger ripples. And that's still maybe only one or two second swell periods because, you know, you're, you're talking about really tiny little basically surface chop. Mm -hmm. As time moves through and you get stronger wind, that those, those little waves that are developing are going to become better organized, increase in swell period as you have more time that the wind is blowing over the ocean. Um, so as soon as you go from basically little surface chop to rideable wind swell, which is roughly around five or six seconds of a, of a swell period, um, once you get more and more wind over, over duration, and in this case, you can imagine a map, um, you're going to have pretty strong southerly winds blowing all the way past here where I am in North Carolina. So you have that long, what's called the fetch, which is basically a pocket of wind, uh, that long fetch that, you know, looks like there's going to be some like 30 to 40 knot pockets of wind in there, which is pretty strong. And then once it's blowing for say 24 hours, you get those increasing swell periods as the seas within this fetch um, become bigger and stronger and more organized and better developed. So that's how, that's why you see Thursday is just that initial short period building of wind swell. But then by Friday, it'll be much more of a developed, what we call a swell, mm -hmm. uh, because once that front moves through the wind switches, those waves actually aren't developing or growing anymore, but they have developed and they're going to be pushing towards the beach and basically arrive. And, you know, with enough time of offshore wind, you'll get that really nice and groomed, clean conditions, which is what we like as surfers. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, you'll notice it because there's a pretty big difference in, in swell energy and how the, the swell actually de develop or the swell actually um, grows depth wise, like deep into the ocean as you go from five or six seconds up to 10 seconds. So mm -hmm. that, that 10 second swell is going to feel like there's way more push and punch to the surf, which is, which is good. Yeah. It's good yeah. for board traces as well. So it's uh, going to move like so small, tiny boards easier if you go. Yep, like exactly. Period and above. So it doesn't necessarily need to have like a offshore winds to build up that period to the nine, 10 seconds, as long as it's blowing consistently with that south wind you know, like kind of onshore wind, I guess, towards the beat, towards us, mm -hmm. the ocean for extended extended period of time. Then it's gonna build up. It's the, so the the energy is going down and deeper and deeper in the ocean and uh, creating extending that period. Um, yeah, basically, yeah. But when you're looking at the, your fetch, which is really all we care about, because the only thing that makes the surfable waves for us is wind. So that fetch area, that pocket of wind, you're looking at the size of it. The strength of it and how long it's blowing for and that basically that's what the wave models and the swell models you're looking at are calculating behind the scenes to get those eight foot at 10 seconds or five foot at six seconds whatever whatever it ends up being um, on any, any given day that's basically what goes into the calculations of the model so yeah. any other sources that uh, anyone can check out to see those features or you know i know like for me i'm kind of at that point, I'll just let Surfline do stuff for me and then bring up the numbers. Uh, but I know some people, they are really going to some GFS models. Uh, mm -hmm. it, is it different? Will they get anything new from other sources or it's going to be the same? Uh, would you, would so, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think for as a meteorologist, like we have so like a crazy amount of data available. Mm -hmm. And it's really like parsing through what's what what can I look at to give me like a quick hitting or what can I what, what kind of blend of data can I look at to give me like the best answer for what's going to happen. And and our surfline model that's called Lotus now is is we tweaked it. We used to have Lola, Lola. which we still run it on the back end, but we've made some tweaks to kind of improve um, some of the nuances that we didn't really love with with Lola. Um, to make Lotus. And I cross reference the Lotus model with what's run through the government, which is called WaveWatch 3. And that model, in conjunction with Lotus, you combine those two, and they normally have a pretty similar forecast. Mm -hmm. um, but in certain scenarios, when whether there's a tropical system or, or a really distant and strong system, you'll have a little bit of a difference in both swell timing, swell, swell peak size, like little things like that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, that can end up making a big difference in the ultimate surf that you're, that you're going to see. But um, yeah, like I'd recommend definitely cross-referencing things um, through Lotus and also Wave Watch 3. And Wave Watch 3 is run by the United States government, so it's free available data for anyone to use. Um, if, you, if, if someone wants to go really nerdy and then get into it to yourself and see how this is going. Exactly, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, one time I, I, I heard someone uh, talking about you know, multiple swells running and ruining the whole surf. Uh, you'd be able to uh, explain more, in more details about that. So for instance, you, know, you have those hurricane swells that we consistently get uh, during the fall season. You know, they come in 13, 14 second period. And then sometimes there would be some sneaky secondary swell with the eight second. And then you get to the beach and you see that it doesn't look like it's gonna, it has more power. It feels like it's a little bit kind of uh, uh, wonky. And, uh, you know, it's not groomed properly, even if it's offshore, but this looks like the, this well kind of died. And then you kind of get upset. It's like, well, there's supposed to be ground swell. What happened? Able to, uh, yeah, that's, for that. <laughs> that's a good question because it all depends. Like for us here on the Outer Banks, if we see that there's a hurricane swell coming, like at 14 seconds, we're not that stoked because it's really not great for our sandbars. Most of the time, it'll be kind of walled and closed out. Like depends on the swell direction, but you know, Rockaway can see some pretty good lefts if if you have the right um, longer period swell, but then when you do get those other like a shorter period or, or a combo of other swells mixing in it can be good it can be bad it all depends on the situation like if you just have like your average uniform beach break which is a lot, a lot of times what it's like here in the outer banks you want a combination of swells to kind of act to not only make it a little bit more peaky and rideable but also break up the lines and kind of break up the current sometimes um, for you guys up there, it's a little less desirable to have those combo swells because, but again, it only, it really depends on the situation. Cause if you, if it's like too short period mixing with some long period, like five or six seconds, it's probably not going to be good. But if you have like a 12 second swell and a nine second swell, that could be pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. So it really depends, <laughs> excuse me. And then it really depends on. The, the current state of the sandbars and the tide and, and the local wind, like there's so many variables that go into it. But personally, I, I do love combo swells and I'll take that any day. I think it's also an advantage of uh, surfers who is, uh, you know, uh, hunting for small sun waves in the inside section. I feel like oh, everyone is usually waiting for the bigger uh, sets out back. And then the, if you can have more chance to score though, that, uh, you know, lower periods well on the inside, uh, which will be breaking close to the shore, I would say. Right? Um, yeah, exactly. Like the more swells in the water, the generally the more consistent surfable waves will be. So yeah, from that perspective, if it's crowded, you, you'd want more swell in the water for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, do you know anything about the uh, uh, underground surfers? Uh, how does it affect our surf? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, from my experience now, I see that New Jersey, I feel like, has a less shallow bottom than Rockaway. Uh, that doesn't mean that they get bigger waves, right? That's that, that's the explanation. You know, you see Rob Kelly snugging like huge, I and mean, it looks like 15-footer waves or Ben Gravy going for the big waves. I've never seen this kind of waves in Rockaway, even if, it's kind of direct swell southeast, I mean, preferably for Rockaway too. Uh, but they do; those waves do stand up like really nice. Uh, is it just because this, the bottom is um, is different? Yeah, exactly. So that what that's called is bathymetry, which mm-hmm. is basically topography but underwater. So you know you're going into the negatives instead of the positives, like on a mountain. But yeah, so for you guys, there's what's called the Hudson Canyon, and that's basically the old riverbed of the Hudson River back when sea levels were way lower during the ice ages. Mm -hmm. So that canyon plays a huge role for you guys. And basically, once you get anything more than, say, 11 or 12 seconds, um, and then you get 
the, the wave energy extending deep into the ocean, that's when the canyon starts to play, play a role. And it ends up kind of sapping some of the energy, the swell energy that would otherwise be heading towards you guys, like towards like Northern New Jersey, like Monmouth County, New Jersey and Queens and kind of directs it towards, you know, central or Southern New Jersey and now towards um, Long Beach. So yeah, Rockaway, like, it seems like the best swells for you guys tend to be less than 12 seconds in general. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do have a combo, like let's say there's like a nor'easter and, and the best day I ever surfed in Long Island was Hurricane Hermine back in 2016, uh, right around Labor Day. And that, that was like a classic case of just, you know, a strong storm sitting right offshore at North winds at, along the coast. It was just like, it was crazy because you had that, bit of a combo between like the shorter period, more easterly directed swell and the, the, the bit of the longer period Southeast swell. So that was, that was a good swell, but yeah, going back to what you said, the bathymetry plays a huge role. And, you know, if you look out, you just sitting on the beach, you're just looking out, you'd have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you did want to like look into this a little bit more on our website, we have what's called uh, the near shore models mm -hmm. and those can, those take in that bathymetry and can really help you dial in like, oh, maybe it's going to be a little bit bigger in Long Beach this time, or maybe Jersey looks like the call because of this swell direction and period combo. It's again, it, it does come down to like the individual variables of any given swell, but you're, you hit the nail on the head with what happens on some of the bigger swells for you guys. Yeah. Should be people uh, worried, I mean, not worried, uh, know the particular angle of the swell that, it would be a good day. Uh, do, does the angle matter for us? Like in, in terms of, I see like 110 degrees. Uh, like I know the, it matters a lot for a pipeline in Hawaii. They like, they know, oh, this is 287 degrees. Well, this is going to work here. Uh, mm -hmm. If I <laughs> see 110 degrees south as well uh, coming to Rockaway, uh, can I be sure that this is going to, you know, d um, be okay? <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's not. Yeah. So it's that's interesting because like Rockaway doesn't have like the biggest swell angle because you basically have like a straight south and then you'll pick up east swell too, but not not great. Um, so that's, you know, that's roughly 90 degrees of swell uh, of your swell window right there. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, like it, you know, like if you have an east swell versus south swell, it's going to be noticeably different on what actually happens and and like when i was growing up in new jersey i'm a goofy footer so i would prefer like an east or even a northeast swell because that <laughs> generally provides lefts mm -hmm. um and where i'm from like it seems like some of the spots actually do better if you have like a northeast swell versus south swell um, and that kind of happens here too on the outer banks but yeah for rockaway like it seems to be less uh fickle or less less of a variable because, you know, obviously things are going to change a little bit depending on the swell direction, but there's not like a huge, huge difference between like a 110 degree or like a 140 degree swell with actually what happens um, at the spots. Like it plays a role, but, you know, you got to be looking at the swell height and the swell period as well to kind of make that whole picture on, on what the surf's going to be like. The reason why I'm asking, I uh, have a friend now who recently started surfing maybe a year or two years ago and uh, he got he called me uh he actually called my friend and then he uh last weekend uh we had a little run of swell uh so he went to new jersey to chase offshore winds and then uh he called him and say hey uh the i served there it was so good because the angle was 110 degrees and i'm like what's going on i mean he just started surfing recently i didn't expect him he he him to care about the angle and uh, he's like no i last time i surfed i wrote it down what the conditions were and then i went there again and i scored the game i'm like wow i should start doing that now <laughs> but for totally. new york, i don't know about new york now but since i think new york doesn't care about the angle as long as <laughs> there's some swell coming <laughs> yeah it, it does seem like especially like western long island the angle it's kind of less important. Like in Jersey, like when you have those South swells, it can just be peeling rights down the whole beach, like constantly. Um, like Long Island South swells hit basically, you know, like straight on versus, versus like sideways. 
which doesn't really offer those like peeling consistent rights. Obviously like the jetties and the groins there mm -hmm. do kind of form little sandbars around and generally can be a consistent spot, but it's not quite the same as what you see in Jersey or even like, like I was saying here on, on, on the right swell direction. So it's, it's, that's an interesting take because in Jersey, you know, you could, you could have a, just, just the way that the, the coastline faces and you're more exposed. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, better or a bigger variety mm -hmm. of, of conditions on any given swell. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. I, uh, think, uh, probably understand a lot of things now, uh, about forecasting, uh, and, uh, let me look at the, uh, forecast again for this upcoming, uh, week, <laughs> I mean, upcoming swell. Uh, I think a lot of listeners will be interested to know, uh what would be the best day uh just to recap um yeah like if you have a window friday afternoon that looks like a no-brainer um i could even see myself trending this forecast up a little bit mm -hmm. um you know four to six is a pretty good size but it could definitely be a little bit bigger than that mm -hmm. um because we have this consistent offshore wind blowing and grooming the swell it might jack up a little bit more uh, that's true too yeah you can you know, when, when there's onshore wind that kind of knocks the swell down a little bit and just makes it crumble. But when you have offshore wind, it, it does kind of jack up um, mm -hmm. and hold up those, those swell lines a little bit. Um, that's not a huge factor as far as what our sizes are going, but yeah, like I would definitely you have, uh, you better have blowing onshore wind overnight versus offshore wind overnight, which from my experience destroys the swell uh, for the next day. Usually if it's blowing all, the, all night, like 30, 40 miles of wind and in the morning, even the, I, I, I see that as surf line would show probably four to six next day and would be will definitely less. Uh, is that, do you think that's how it happens sometimes overnight? Yeah, it all depends though. Like this case, there's going to be plenty of swell over the weekend too. Just the, just the scenario, how this weather pattern is setting up mm -hmm. because you have a really strong high pressure system that moves over the Atlantic and combine that with the low pressure system that's going to be moving through on Friday, that actually acts to significantly increase the amount of wind. Um, basically, it's good. there's going to be wind extending way past Bermuda mm -hmm. with this system. So if you basically all you got to do is time out the travel time from there um, to New York, and basically you'll still have swell by Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to make some tweaks to this forecast later today when I do my update. Looks Saturday looks a little less favorable, just strictly based on the local wind there. Yeah, as you see that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, by Sunday, there still should be a little bit of surf left, better winds. I would just watch out for that morning high tide. But um, this is suspicious to me. I mean, when I look at it and I see 1.29 seconds, I... I for me, it's uh, really suspicious. Uh, I think it's because you kind of were too conservative and then drop it down to, to, to you know, to, you know, two to three. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that that forecast right there isn't showing a ton of swell, but the uh, like I was saying a little bit ago, the Wave Watch three model actually has a little bit more swell mm -hmm. left over for the weekend, which I'm leaning towards that scenario. Um, Again, it's not going to be like huge or that great over the weekend, but it's not going to be flat. And, you know, if anyone tries to get a few longboard sessions in, it, there'll definitely be something on offer. So, yeah. But keep keep expectations pretty low, just, to, you know, for longboarding wave kind of. <laughs> exactly. Out. Yeah. If it's clean and waist high, like that can be pretty fun for a lot of people. So, mm -hmm. so in general, it depends on the system weather pattern, what's happening overnight and then during the week, I mean, right after the swell event. So sometimes it would be just quick uh, storm moving off the coast or wherever, and then it would uh, show pretty good di data, I mean, high numbers on the model, and then it would blow off offshore whole night and it might kill the swell because the, the that uh, storm wasn't um, uh, strong enough, right? To to provide this. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you have like a really short lived or small system that maybe only gives you a window of like six hours of decent surf, mm -hmm. then yeah, if you have strong offshore winds overnight, the next day there might, it might be totally flat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, it, it all depends on the specific scenario of what's going on. And, you know, this, this, 
this type of swell is one that I really like because it doesn't just die off in mm -hmm. half a day. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be one that'll be lingering and even there'll even be some waves into early next week too from it. Again, pretty small, but you know, this time of year, it's better yeah. than flat. So, we'll we'll yeah. take it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, do you personally use any other uh, surf forecast apps, uh, you know, just to compare, uh, you know, I know there's a surf captain app now just uh, got on board, you know, kind of giving like a kind of small data, not a lot of information, just, uh, you know, model, uh, I guess, the predictions, uh, but not much uh, information in terms of writing down, like, hey, what should you expect for the whole week? What's happening around uh, in Anything else you you, you use uh, just to? For yeah, I mean, I'll I'll definitely look around at times, especially if it's like a really complex scenario. Um, I use Magic Seaweed occasionally um, because they, especially if it's you know if I'm looking at a forecast for like Europe or mm -hmm. somewhere that I'm not that familiar with, mm -hmm. um, because those I feel like they offer good spot based information, which is something that us at Surfline we're going to be trying to improve that, you know, cause we do a lot of regional forecasting, which is generally, generally to basically suggest what the better spots in a region are gonna be like on a day, which doesn't always give you the most, you know, actionable information, especially in places like Southern California, where you have a huge variety of spots that are reefs or beach breaks, and you get like the offshore island shadowing involved, like that gets pretty complicated. Fortunately, we don't have those things to deal with on the East Coast, generally speaking. But um, yeah, like if if there's any good reliable data that I can look at, I'll look at it. But it seems like basing my forecasts off both our our personal or our proprietary data at Surfline and what the government's providing, mm -hmm. which basically like Wave Watch Three is what's running mm -hmm. um, like Swell Info and Surf Captain. So they're you know. They're just running the the free, reliable, fairly reliable government data, which isn't a bad model. Like, again, I look at Wave Watch Three a lot, so um, no 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 shade on them. They just basically have it output exactly what it says, and sometimes that's right, and sometimes it's not. But again, um, any any kind of data that I can get my hands on is that's good is is going to be helpful. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's uh, definitely. Uh, cannot be like 100% accurate all the time. I mean, there are you know, sometimes the, just the regular weather cannot be predicted right. You know, you know, forget about the waves because <laughs> the, there's yeah, so like, many things involved into this forecasting uh, besides the wind, the, uh, you know, fetch uh, plus the bo 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 bottom uh, part of the shallow barometry effects and all other things. Uh, so. Versus versus like a regular weather when you know exactly okay this is this move front is moving this we're gonna have fifty five degrees tomorrow I think that's much easier than <laughs> predicting you know you're right you're totally right it, the the ocean is a crazy thing and it's after doing this for five years I'm like I feel pretty confident in a lot of scenarios but then all of a sudden there'll be a swell that just like either overperforms or underperforms expectations and it's just humbling because that's just how it is. You know, if you can't, this is, this is like predicting the future. This is literally predicting the future. And <laughs> I don't care what industry you're in, there's going to be errors and the ocean itself is just prone to throw you for some loops sometimes, but that's, that's what keeps us on our toes. And, and it's, it's, it's really satisfying to get a forecast, right. Um, and that's, that's what we strive for. Uh, yeah. You're predicting day. actually the someone's, uh, day like it would be good or not good you know so a lot of people they have high expectations and the day they, they come to the beach and the day is ruined but we you know try, with this uh, podcast i will try to help people to manage the expectations and uh you know keep it low all the time out here i mean california i think yeah. the expectation would be higher for sure because i know that, you know the groundswell will deliver something it's just over time people get uh i think spoiled like especially when you move from the east coast to the west coast initially you're like taking wherever you can then you get a little bit mellow it's like no two to three it's flat <laughs> exactly and it is there is a lot of like actual psychology going on because expectations are so important but also i i have one thing i have noticed is that people 
do rely on us a lot. And I, and I take that like with a great honor. Um, but at the same time, I feel like people are just, they have such high expectations that even if we are a little bit wrong, that it's like throws off their whole day. And, and that's not what we really want to see. But I mean, I feel bad if my forecasts are wrong regardless, but you know, don't be that person who's, who, you know, ends up a, a little bit of a forecast mistake ends up ruining their whole day. Like, Mm-hmm. If you if you get a few waves, sure. If it's not up to expectations, then that's not a good feeling. But you know, it all depends on how you how you view it, and and that's something that I've been working on, um, and I try to lean my friends toward as well. So yeah, yeah, it's the same thing happening with the surfing too. It's not just you know waves. It's um, you know bringing different boards and uh, how you expect manage expectations with uh, what do you expect from uh, from board. You know, you buy a new board and you're expecting it to work and then it doesn't work. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've yet to I've yet to experience a board not working, but that's that's just me being fortunate, I guess. You definitely have tried a lot more boards than I have in my day. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much, Rob. It was really helpful uh, to go over surf forecasting. Uh, so we got more information on that. And uh, hope you were feeling better and uh, get to 100%. So, yeah, dude. Thanks so much, Yuri. I, I appreciate it and uh, looking forward to seeing this go live. All right. Thank you. All right, dude. I'll catch you later. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye.